like, no, I'm looking for a granola bar. And I couldn't find it, but I swore I put it in there. And then my friend's like, you gave it to me. And I was like, oh, that was really nice of me. I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> I really wanted it. <laughs> okay. So again, we're finishing up weak acids, strong bases, titration stuff, all the all of that is being done this week, but you're going to be starting in lecture, kinetic stuff like I just said. Again, please join me in my office hour if things don't make sense ever, because I'm always there. I just have to sit there, so if anyone shows up, that's perfectly fine. Some announcements is that, again, we're moving into kinetics for three weeks of math. So more math, but I'm hoping that by showing some different patterns today, also showing a bit of like a trend, you won't actually have to do a lot of math. It'll actually be a lot of simple math, like multiplying by four, multiplying by three, etc. Easy, easy stuff. After that, though, um, you're going to move into oxidation and reduction for two weeks, and then you have OCHEM for your final week. So that is the rest of the semester. The thing I will say is if kinetics is giving you trouble, and maybe you can't reach me, SI isn't being helpful, whatever, first time we go to Khan Academy, because actually if someone on there who does kinetics, he's a PCHEM professor who's retired, and he does those videos, and I find his explanation is like top notch in comparison to like some other videos that they do. And then also, if you want like a little short something, there's a, a PCHEM tutor called Melissa Maribel who's on YouTube, who also does really nice short video explanation. So if it's like a quick hit quiz recap kind of thing you're looking for, hers are like two, three minutes of a nice little like, here's an overview, which is always good sometimes to like refresh your memory. Okay, due date, again, there's no free lab. Everything else is as per usual. The only thing I want to highlight is you have two activities that are not due this Sunday, but they're available to you today, sometime around midnight. It will be open for a couple weeks. You will be able to do the rate laws and orders part after this whole week of lectures, and possibly even after this recitation session. So I would definitely recommend getting one of them out of the way this weekend, especially because you don't have to do them on Tuesday, just the lab. So getting that out of the way on your, you know, after homework on Friday would be a-okay, and then working on the rates and half-life one on its own for the following week. Because you'll be learning about that one in lecture next week, and then, of course, that weekend is when it's due. So it'd be nice to kind of, like, space them out if you wanted to, making that just, like, noticeable. So, again, same kind of thing this week, except with the weak acid. So it means really honing in on your Ka value, using your Ka value, how you find that Ka value, etc., and getting it all from your titration curve. So, the biggest thing we use is the estimation of our sodium hydroxide volume. That is what you should be referring to in each section. That's because at that equivalence value is that when you use that, you're then going to find your equivalence point, which gives you your half equivalence point, which is all relatable to your weak acid. That's the thing where we get all of our info from. So, the colorimetric one. The only thing I have to say about this, we did it last week, is that the color did not show up log out, log back in, and redo it. Because something got beyond labs, for some odd reason, people were adding this and it wasn't working. And again, of course, please use the pipette to measure out your HCL. Some people didn't do that either for some unbeknownst reason. For the point geometric one, please note that your graph should look slightly different. Remember, this is your buffering zone before it pops up. So please be aware, look for your buffer zone. That's where you're gonna find all that wonderful info. Specifically, the thing I want to point out here is please record all of your at readings to the hundredth place. If you do not, I saw some people already do not, then I can take off marks for sig figs. Because again, sig figs is the name of the game when you're doing things with burettes or pipettes or anything of the sort. With pipettes, you can go to the hundredth place as well. And then burettes is because when you look at a burette reading, if we go back a bit, for like future reference of ever you're doing stuff in an actual lab setting, you can see how it's the tenth place. I can go, this is 22.3-ish. But then if I really close it, I can say, you know, it's slightly under three. So I can say with confidence that it's definitely not three. And therefore, I can say it's 22.29 or so. I can say that with confidence. OK. Now, again, as I remember this, and I want to remind you guys, at the half equivalence point, that's when the acid equals the conjugate base in monoprotic acids like acetic acid. That is also when the Ka value then is equal to your hydronium ion concentration. And of course, you and I know that if I take the negative log of both of those, I get the pH equal to pKa, which is exactly what happens at our half equivalence point. And so it'd be very smart of me to make that connection 
when I'm explaining things in this lab, those discussion questions are going to be really harping in on why that equivalence point is when the pH is going to equal the pKa. And that's because of that half equivalence point, that is when you get the, high, the weak acid equal to the conjugate base. And in a monoprotic acid, you and I know that it's one H to one acid, and then one to one ratio for that conjugate base. So that means that we can then say that the Ka value is equal to the concentration of my hydronium ion, and so on. OK. Now, I'm going to go back, actually. Is there any questions on the lab before I get into kinetics? Everyone's happy with the lab? Awesome. OK, a quick intro to kinetics, something you've not seen before, unless you took a similar class before. So the thing that you have here is I'm actually going to use a pointer. It's just so much easier to do. What a horrible noise. There we go. So you have reactants, and you have products. And in reality, in real equations, you're going to have coefficients in front of them, whether it's 1, 2, 3, and so on. When we think about rea reaction rates and what that means, is we're mostly looking at how fast something is being used up in order to make something. So this red curve would represent, in this case, reactants being made if equilibrium were lying to the right to be used up in order to make something. Because again, equilibrium would be lying to the right. If equilibrium relies on the left, then these would be flip-flopped. So the way that we do that is by looking at the signs and saying, OK, since this is being used up, I know that that slope is going to be negative. So I'm going to say negative 1. Since this slope is positive because they're being made, they're either going to be plus 1 over some arbitrary number. And that always is going to be the coefficient in front. Because if you had noticed, the rates of all of these the change of that concentration divided by that change in time relates to all of them. They're all equal because they all are, in a way, related to each other. We can't have products forming without reactants being used up. And so they're all related that way. However, it's just that they are in a stoichiometric balance, right? We have so many moles on one side and so many moles on the other in their mole to mole ratio. If we increase the moles on one side, that will then increase the production or decrease the production depending on their mole ratio. If this is, you know, 2 and this is 3, if we increase this, it might actually just level out the playing field. We don't know. So that's why we have to look at the reaction rate to see if we increase that concentration, if we increase the time that this reaction takes place over, is that going to change our overall reaction? Things like temperature, giving more heat to something etc. So, the thing we need to know is, is that D is for delta, and delta means change. So all the time we're actually looking at the change of concentration divided by the change in time. And then we're also looking at the ratio of them together to find that overall rate. So the rate itself will always be negative 1 over the coefficient times the change in the concentration divided by the change in time. And then those will all be equal to each other within a singular system. Okay, does that make sense to everybody so far? A little quick recap, if not new introduction. Okay, with that being said, we're going to flip over, hopefully, hopefully, yes, to our recitation guide. Okay, so we're going to start with something we know, tried and tested, identifying a Bronsted acid and base along with a conjugate acid and base. The reason we always like to harp on these and why they're so important is because they speak volumes about what's going on with reaction rates, and they also give a hint about it here when we're going to move into some OCHEM. This is like a classic OCHEM question. Okay, so the first things first, a Bronsted acid is a hydrogen donor, right? We know that, we've seen that before. Bases are hydrogen acceptors. Again, how I move forward with these? So I basically find who are the pairs, because if you're ever finding a conjugate, and you should always be looking for their conjugates, it's always going to be something that has a pair. So first I'm going to mark off that ammonia and water are separate species, and now I'm just looking for their pair across the way. When I look at NH4+, I think it looks much more like NH3 than water, so I'm going to say that NH4+, or that ammonium ion, is a much like ammonia. Makes sense, their names are similar. And then when I see this OH minus, it definitely looks like OH1 versus O2H. And so that means that this is probably going to be his conjugate, whatever. 
Next thing I'm going to do is figure out who's the donor and who's the acceptor. So when I look at my first pair, I have NH3 becoming NH4. So that's one plus. If they have a plus one hydrogen, that means that they accepted a hydrogen between each other. So this is going to be my Bronsted base. To make sure that this is my acid, I just have to look at it in the reverse. And if it loses a hydrogen or donates a hydrogen, then that's my conjugate acid. And sure enough, NH4 becomes NH3, which is minus one. And so that in and of itself is going to be the conjugate acid. Next, I look at water. I'm like, okay, I have H2O or O2H, and that becomes OH1. And so if I lose a hydrogen on the other side, that's a hydrogen donor. And so I know this is my Bronsted acid. And if I look at it in the reverse, I have OH1 becoming OH2. And so it gained a hydrogen, and so that makes it a very good conjugate base. Everyone saw that? That should be pretty good with you. Okay, now that I do some organic chemistry. So the first thing whenever you're doing an arrow pushing diagram is you're going to want to draw out that Lewis structure. So right now I'm going to draw my ammonium, and it's again nitrogen with my three hydrogens surrounding it. Pretty classic looking thing. And then I'm going to have my water molecule. Again, a nice bent with those four electron charges on my oxygen. Okay, great. Everything looks good so far. I'm going to want to make them look like they do on the other side. Nitrogen here has four hydrogens. Well, the only one that it accepts a hydrogen from, in this case, is going to be my water molecule. So I'm going to draw my possible bond line in. And you and I know, to make a bond, we need two electrons. And we know that my product is not one from this one and one from this one, because that would make a sort of NH4OH2 sort of looking molecule. But that's not what we get. We get two separate species. So what I know is that two electrons go into this bond. If two electrons go in, two electrons must go out. And in this case, it's going to be a bond that breaks. Because where else is it going to go? We have to get rid of the one that it's attacking. And if it's attaching to this hydrogen, this hydrogen's like, OK. And oxygen, being electronegative, says, well, I want the electrons. And so hydrogen says, well, I'm very electropositive. I don't, need, I don't need any of this. So it gladly gives up those two back to be able to bond with nitrogen. So then what we get is a nitrogen that now has four hydrogens surrounding it. And because at first it was neutral, now it has an extra positive ion on it. It's going to have a plus charge on it. And then we say plus, and of course, as you know, we got an oxygen that has this one, two, three, four, and this new sixth pair of electrons, or sorry, I should say third pair of electrons of six electrons in total. And because that is overall more negative than oxygen is, right? Because oxygen has six valence electrons. So we're going to label one of them as a negative sign to show that that is OH minus. That makes sense to everybody how we did that? It's a bit okay, hopefully not too heavy. Okay, I'm getting nods and happy hooks, so that's good. I haven't broken anyone. Next, now, it's given us a reaction. It says 2NO plus 2H2 becomes nitrogen, N2, plus two water molecules. Okay, that's fine. And now it says, for number, for number, for part A, what is the rate order in NO, nitrogen oxide, and hydrogen based on the equation? The thing you're going to learn is, is again, when you look at this rate, it's either something's being formed or broken up, and it's a change of concentration over the change of time. When I look at this at first glance, it's telling me a reaction, and it hasn't told me anything about concentration or time. So my answer is going to be five. More info is needed because I need concentrations, I need times, or you need to tell me one of the rates of one of these things to let me know how to work backwards, right? If it told me what is the rate order because this one is this, then I can work backwards. I can start working through it. But it doesn't tell me any of that. It just tells me the reaction, which is a good start, right? Because it's going to give me A, B, or I should say lowercase A, B, C, or D, but without a concentration, that means nothing to me. I have no clue what's going on. Now, 
let's see if we did have that, right? So it says, if the rate of formation for nitrogen is 33 torr per minute, calculate the reaction rate for nitrogen oxide. So, you and I know that all these rates equal each other. Now, it's saying rate of formation for nitrogen. So notice, I have a nice positive out front, right? And it says calculate the reaction rate for nitrogen oxide. Well, if nitrogen's being formed, the nitrogen oxide must be being demolished or used up, however you want to say it. So it's got a minus in front. I know this one is one over one, right? Because N2 has one in front of it, or nothing but a one. If it had a zero, it wouldn't be there. And that equals 1 over B. And in this case, B, lowercase b, is equal to 2. So it's now telling me, by the way, the rate of formation of nitrogen gas is 33 per minute. OK, so this is 33 torr per minute. That's all fine. And that equals negative 1 half of my, and it's calculated the reaction rate. Well, the reaction rate is the DNO divided by DT. So I'm looking for this. Well, now we've got everything we need. I just need to take, now, 33 times negative 2, and that will equal my reaction rate of D of NO divided by DT. So that equals negative 66 torr per minute. Great. Check, check, done. Everyone saw that? That was pretty simple. That's what I'm saying about simple math. We shouldn't even have to follow our calculators. You can to double check. I, I definitely recommend that. But other than that. We shouldn't be too far in our heads. Okay, C and D don't require any math at all. It's saying if the reaction is a first order in NO and second order in H2, what would be the rate of formation of nitrogen if you double the amount of NO? Okay, so I'm doubling the amount of NO. And NO is a first order reaction. So I'm going to write all this important stuff down first. So N order is, NO is first order. Okay. Now, the thing that I have to know is, is we have to learn what these all mean. So this is something that you're going to learn hopefully this week, but um, it's going to help us answer the question. This is something that I would definitely recommend um, downloading or re watching back to find. But essentially what this is is my little cheat sheet that I always carry with me before my phys chem exams, aka kinetics exams. It's basically zero order is when the rate is not affected. So that means if I were to double the concentration, the rate stays the same. So that means my rate equals my rate constant. So my concentration is increasing, but the rate is remaining the same. If it's first order, which is in the case of NO. And remember, we're doubling our NO. So for first order, the rate is proportional to the concentration. So what that means is, is if I double the concentration, the rate doubles. So what that means is, is say the rate to start off with is 2. And the beginning concentration is 4. Now, that means that if I make this double, so multiply by 2, that becomes 8. The rate then doubles, which means 2 times 2 is 4. See how that happened? So it's just both of them were multiplied by 2. Another way is if they're multiplied by another number. Let's say you start off with one that's 3, and that equals K6. Uh, and say I want to multiply it by a half now. So this one by a half is 3 halves. This one equals K of 2. Or no, 3. I can't even do simple math. I don't know why I'm sending it in. But these are now related by a half, right? So it's all the same numbers. Same over here. Now I have a second order. Oh, well first let's go back to answer our question. So NO is first order. What would the rate of the formation of nitrogen be if you double the amount? Well, like we said, if I double the concentration, then the rate doubles. That's pretty simple. Okay. That makes sense to everybody who saw that? Because they're proportional in their graph. Okay, second order. Rate is proportional to the square of the concentration. So it looks like this. So when I double the concentration, 
the rate goes up four times, or quadruples. So what that looks like is, is say I have a rate of two equals my k of four. Well, if now we have k, oh, whoops, k of eight, then this gets, oh, well, this doesn't quite look like it, square root of four. Okay, but now say I move up again, and I double it again to now 16, well, this is multiplied by four to become 16. Right? So this is going up by squares. 2 squared becomes 4. 4 squared becomes 16. Does that make sense? So multiply by 4. Okay. We're seeing it. Good. Okay. Now, similarly, we'll walk in the rate of formation for nitrogen. If I double the amount of hydrogen, so as we just said, second order in hydrogen, so I use 2, second order. As we just learned, for second order, if you double the concentration, the rates quadruples. No one answered my question, I'll answer it myself. Or multiplies by four. I'm four. Okay? And that's that way with any second order. Okay. Now, last few, just to show this in action, so what you're gonna see. Bunch of numbers. If I could zoom in there. Okay. We can't kind of see it. So, first we're looking at what is the rate law for the reaction. If you're going to do a rate law, you're always going to write rate equals the K of the reactant. So in this case, we've got A. So of A to the X, which we're going to find, times B to the Y, which we're going to find. So, whenever you have two variables that you're looking for, you're going to have to pull some tricks out from that algebra class that you thought you'd never have to use again. Where you look for something that has the same value so you can cross it off your list and compare them. So in this case, if I want to do A, I want B to have the same. So when I look at B then, the ones that have the same are trials 2 and 3. So if I'm going to compare A, I'm going to be looking at trials 2 and 3 because that's when B stays constant. So I'm going to mark off these two, which means their rates are going to be what we compare. So when I think of 0.25, it would be multiplied by 2 to get to 0.5. If I take 0.79 divided by 0.4, that is equal to about 1.8, which actually, actually we can round up to say is 2. Now, these are both related by 2. And like we just said, when you double the concentration, the rate doubles. That's what happened here. We doubled the concentration, and the rate also doubled. If you tripled the concentration and this tripled, that would be the same idea. And so then we know that this x is equal to 1 because this is first order. So that's good. Next, now we're looking at b. So again, I want A to be the same. So that seems to be trials one and two. So if I look at B and then the comparative rates, I'm gonna say 0.13 times two gets me to 0.026. And then when I look at 0.4 divided by 0.22, I get about a multiple of 1.9, which is again comparable to two. And so again, I've got two and two, the concentration doubled, and so the rate doubled, so that also makes y then equal to 1, which again is first order. So when I look at this rate law now and I write it all out, I'm going to say rate equals lowercase k of a to the 1 times b to the 1, which then you can rewrite to make it more simple looking, is k times a, the concentration of a, times the concentration of b. So this is to say, the individual rate order for A is 1, and for B is 1, or first. But the overall reaction rate is a second order. We just add them together. 1 plus 1 is 2. Okay? So the whole reaction is a second order, but the individual ones are first order. Okay, last question. We have calculate the initial rate for trial 2. And then finally, calculate the initial concentration. So, if I'm going to start off calculating the initial rate, I want to find A. Simple said, okay. I look at this and I say to find the rate, 
I'm going to need to know the kind of relationship that's going on. And luckily, they've told us, right? They're saying the rate equals k times b squared. The thing I want to note, though, is I have two reactants. If I have two reactants, that means I should have two here. The only reason I would not is if A were zero order, because anything raised to the power of zero equals one. So that means that what I have then is A to the zero order and B to the second order. That's good enough for me. Now remember, for second order, if I double the concentration, the rate goes up by four. If I triple it, the rate goes up by nine, right? It would be in that kind of order, be square, whatever it is. So, with that being said, I look here, luckily the A's are the same, so these two trials are comparable, otherwise this wouldn't be doable. So that's a good start. So I remember from up here that 0 0.26 in comparison to 0 0.1, 0 0.013 is in by multiple two. So, like we said for second order, if I double the concentration, the rate goes up four times, so that means here, I just have to multiply by 4, and I'm going to get my answer. If this were 3, then I'd multiply by 9, and so on. So you just have to make sure you're finding the right square. So, then I just do 4.06 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per second times 4, and that equals 1.62 times 10 to the negative 5 moles per second. Great! One down. Moving on to B. Okay. Now B, I'm finding the initial concentration of B. This one takes a little bit more abstract thinking. So, the first thing I note is I remember that A is a zero order reaction. And this is proving to be the same, right? Because I have this concentration doubled and the rate remains the same. So that's all adding up fine. The problem is, is I want to know B. Now here's the thing. A doubled, but nothing happened. However, B is a second order reaction. So if B were to double, triple, that should then affect the rate here by some number. It should increase by a, by a square. And it didn't. It stayed the same. The only way that would be true then is if B itself stayed the same. We would not, if this were to increase by some factor above this number here, then that would show in the rate because it's still second order. So because it didn't, the safest bet to assume here is then B is equal to 0 0.013 molar. Because again, B is second order. So that means the rate would be affected by a square. And since it was not, because again, we know A is needing to show that it is as well, zero order, so A is not affecting that. What's the only thing that's affecting it is B, and but B can't because B stayed the same. And we can tell that because the rate remained. All right? Everyone's happy with that? To, as happy as you can be for never learning it before? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Hopefully tomorrow you feel like you have a leg up on every minute of the class. Okay, that's all we're going to do with that. So no more traumatizing me with rates. And then you guys can stick around and ask me any questions you'd like on the lab. And if you have no questions, thank you so much for coming. And I'll see you guys next week. Awesome. And I'll be happy once I get out of here somehow. There we go. Why do you